Welcome to the V2 Football Podcast. I'm Shane Lees, your host, and joining me this week, we've got Dan Tracy. Evening. We've got Nick Davey. Yeah, yeah, good evening. And we've got Anthony Kendrick. How are you all doing? All good, thanks. Yeah, good. Hello. Good. There we go. Okay, we're going to get straight into it, and this week, we there's a big topic, and this is, I'm going I'm to try and hold my tongue for as long as I possibly can, but this is one that has really, really irritated me. I wonder what's first on the list here. Yeah, and I, I think me and Anthony had a little bit of a debate before about this, but um, Josep Bartomeu, I can't actually know how to pronounce that, the Barcelona chairman, has said he wants a European wild card, so the big teams in Europe get a almost guarantee free pass into the Champions League. Now that picks up a little bit in the later week where there was talk about a European Super League and the major Premier League clubs met up to talk about the European Super League. This idea of the big clubs in Europe break away from the Champions League and have their own league where they are guaranteed a spot every single year. So I want to ask you guys, and I'm going to try and not say anything for as long as I can, what do you think of this? I'll go first then. I think it's a terrible idea. Uh, Firstly, the wild cards. I think if you take away footballing merit, it almost sort of kills off football really doesn't it I mean you can't just have a closed shop I know you have it in some sort of American sports but their whole sort of structure the the sport itself is completely different to football so I don't think you can sort of pull the ladder up and say right we'll have a nucleus of 16, 20 teams and that'll be it I just think no not for me To to play devil's advocate the MLS for instance has no promotion or relegation it's you buy into the league and then you're in. It's That league's still in its infancy though isn't it it's still sort of only what 15, 20 years old it's that again, it hasn't really got the structures in place, so it's it's still a work in progress of sort of American soccer. But I think it, not just English football, but just football as we know it as a whole, it's got so much heritage. I don't think we can sort of say right, well that'll do. Like we'll just uh, cut off the sort of lifeblood of how sort of football's run from day to day. I, no, I, I don't think that's a good idea. All right, to say with the promotion relegation thing, there's an argument you could say that team a team such as say QPR. If they knew they were going to be in the Premier League every year, they can then calculate their future incomings, etc. And it would help them out. Like it may help teams financially to be able to predict their future, you know, earnings, etc. And you know, you see a lot of teams in the football league going, you know, getting into trouble. Look at Bolton. Look at all the financial fair play. There's several other teams in trouble. I won't disagree with that, but I will say that clubs like Man United and Barcelona and PSG don't really have too many financial concerns. There's, oh, no, 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 there's no threat of them going bust, and that's what we're talking about. It's yeah, the big sorry. clubs. Sorry, I was talking about the promotion and relegation thing. Um, on that, though, I do think it's important in the Champions League. I think from a, um, a perspective of being a fan watching it, you want to see the big teams play in the Champions League, and it is important. I think that they're there. But surely the big teams are only the big teams of their time. Because no, if we can, if we go back further enough, wouldn't we say Leeds are a big team, Aston Villa are a big team, Nottingham Forest are a big team? Yeah, yeah, Depp- yeah. Depp- Depp- Deportivo, think... Deportivo are a massive team. Uh, <laughs> wow. Well, well, they, they were. They had a, a long stretch yeah, of almost were, 10, 20 years now, of winning. Exactly. It, it all changes, it, isn't it? But that's why you need big teams. There, big teams otherwise... become middling teams. Middling teams yeah, we... become big teams. It all switches over. So how can you say exactly. at a fixed That's... point in time, these are the big teams I want to see them playing each other each year? Because they could still decline. Even no matter even if they have you know guaranteed European football, they could have declined and they wouldn't be the best teams. And the best teams wouldn't be in the competition. It w- it wouldn't necessarily be the same wild cards every year. But there are teams with bigger fan bases and other teams. Look at a team like AC Milan, for instance. They've not been in the Champions League for a while, and they're. I don't think you could argue based you know on the fans and all that. They're not a big team. I think other big teams, I think it's important that they are involved. I I understand the arguments against it for footballing reasons, of course, but I do think there is another argument that the big teams have to play in the Champions League because at the end of the day, that's what's on TV, that's what's set, and that's what people want to see. Is it all financially motivated? Of course it is. Yeah, of course it is. So should you be... Can I give give you an example? Let, Let me take Leicester City, for instance. Leicester City will presumably get in the Champions League next season. Do you think a foreign fan, say a Spanish fan or a German fan, would rather see Leicester or, say, Liverpool? They'd probably rather see Liverpool. Exactly. And that is... But here's the, here's the ultimate counter, and it's the point Dan made before, and for me, this is this is the main argument. Liverpool didn't earn that spot. Leicester did. No, they didn't. They didn't. Of course they didn't. But then... And ultimately, 
sport, not just football, sport, no matter whether it's the Olympics or whether or not it's rugby, sport, the central thing behind every single sport is competition. Yes. And if but... you take away the right to earn and win, you know, things like titles and trophies, and that would be what would happen, you'd be taking them away and saying you can't win European trophies, you're not a big enough club, you've, you've got rid of competition, and it's not a sport anymore, it's purely a business. The thing, the thing with the wild cards is it would be a couple of wild cards, you know, say, you know, four, four wild cards a season or something like that. Yeah, but uh, right now, at the moment, it looks more likely that if anything does happen, it will be the European Super League idea. Which would be essentially a closed competition between Look, whoever decides to have the biggest yeah, teams. Absolute shocking idea. I, I can't agree with the European Super League, but I do. Ca- I can kind of see the wild cards idea coming off. Well, yeah, with I, wild cards though, like it's almost rewarding sort of failure, isn't it? It's like, well, why should Liverpool finish eighth in the league, get a, a spot in the Champions League? Why should AC Milan, a, you know, eighth in Serie A, get the same? It's they're not. Yeah, if they, ha- if they haven't they earned big, it. They're only big clubs in stature, but it's, they keep finishing outside the sort of league sort of places that you'd originally think of Champions League positions. And you think, well, how long can they be a big club for? Like, the, the, big, know, the big teams are the ones who achieve the most and who are, have the best players. And if they do not achieve and do not have the best players, then they aren't going to finish high in the league. Therefore, they have not earned a right to be in those positions. You can say what you want about Leicester being a big team. They've earned their right so far. They've, got, they've been one of the best teams in the league this season. They've had some of the best players in the league this season, regardless of whether or not they're big names. So it changes year by year. And so to at any point nail down and say, you are a big team, you are in this, you're just saying at the time, you're, you're, you're good. Because otherwise, why wouldn't we include the likes of Nottingham Forest, Champions League winners in the past, in this wild cards? You have a championship side suddenly in the Champions League. It would be mad. It would be absolutely insane. So why would you go ahead and say, a side that's finishing 10th place in Serie A, that's fine. It's it's just such a a random scale, I think. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Shane. It is, but today I don't think Forest have anywhere near as big a fan base as a team like Liverpool is. The thing is, is football's there as an it, it's for the fans and it's for entertainment and exactly it's for the fans and the fans are of all of fans the fans. Are, the, Sorry, the fans. Is it, you're right. It's about the fans and the fans are all of the fans, not the fans of the not the, not the glory hunters, not the select few who just so happen to have supported a big. No, club. no, no. But as it's new- everyone. As a neutral fan, in a, a, a foreign fan, a, a England is such a small place, I think, as a neutral, I'd be more interested in watching, say, Liverpool against Real Madrid than I would Leicester against Real Madrid, for instance. Yeah, no, and I completely get that point, but I'll put it this way. One of the best games I've ever seen was Newcastle v Arsenal. And Newcastle, they may have been a fairly big club at one point, but they're not a big club a these days. Draw. Yeah, the four-all draw. It's one of the best games I've ever seen. When Chef Tiago scored. Yeah, as a neutral, watching those games, it's going to depend on how the game goes. In terms of watching the most entertaining game, yes, you want to see the biggest players, but the biggest players are not consistently going to be at the same clubs. I just think, no matter which way you go about it, Wild Cards, European Super League, there's going to be a cutoff for this essentially elite clubs who have the most money, the most income, saying we want more. It's all about them getting the most money it's and it's not a surprise the timing of this you look look at the spanish tv deal they've just had had it told to them that you're gonna have to start sharing your money out and the big clubs in spain are not liking that apparently this is not being led by the premier league but it's being led mostly by other teams in the continent arsenal have already turned around and said we don't want this so you're you're also seeing a managerial flight to the premier league where the best managers are coming to the premier league it's so much about the big clubs afraid they're not going to get their lion's share They're, they're worried about the money in the premier league they're worried about not getting their money anymore rather than any sporting consideration and for me, I think if you genuinely support this idea, 100% you think this is a great idea, you are literally a traitor to football. Because this is sport. This is sport. This is what it is. It's competition. Things change. You have your good years, you have your bad years. You've got to get used to it. It's not going to be good times over, 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 over a while. You have to get used to it. If your club goes for a bad patch, tough shit. You just so happen to pick a team that doesn't do well. Look at Villa. Villa fans over the years, they've had the, some great times, and now they're having absolutely tragic times. It's just how it goes. That's what sport is, good times and bad times. And if you take away the bad times for the sake of money, you're ruining sport. That's my opinion. Let's make one final point. Um, there was a meeting this week of all the Premier, uh, some of the big Premier League chairmen. I, I also think there's the effect of China as well, and the Chinese market, which yeah. could be a serious threat to the major European leagues. You know, the amount of money they're spending on players, that could be another... Yeah, no, I definitely agree that the, the, there is a bit of a worry about China. The one thing I will say about China is people aren't really looking long term. It's mainly dependent on how long the current Chinese president stays in charge and also the fact they financially cannot sustain this for so so much time because 
the big uh, Chinese billionaires who are investing in is will eventually want to see some returns, and when they don't, they will pull out. I think that's a short-term thing more than anything. It's a bit like being worried about the Qatari leagues. <laughs> but uh, okay. also with the um, European Super League, I think there's a couple of caveats to that because I think you've got to think of the Premier League money. I don't think each club are ready to walk away from that just yet with uh, it being so much of an increase in the summer. Also, um, if you took all the, you know, say these major European clubs, let's say 20 for sake of argument, and each of these teams are all used to winning their respective league, say PSG or Juventus, for example, they're not going to all of a sudden want to be bottom of the league, are they? Because then that sort of tarnishes their image almost. It sort of goes against what they want to be as a, a big club. So you don't want to necessarily be 16th out of the best 16 because then you, you're not a winner anymore. So I think... Yeah, then the scale changes even more because suddenly you're like, what, why is this a big team? Why should they be here? They're finishing bottom for this league every year. The, exactly. one, the one thing I will say is the European Super League wouldn't be a breakaway from the Premier League, so you wouldn't see the top four leave the Premier League. <laughs> what you would see is them leave the Champions League. So the European Super League would replace the Champions League as interna- uh, as uh, yeah, European competition. But so. would then UEFA sanction that? So then what would happen if those teams left for the European Super League? Would they then be allowed to play in the Premier League? There's... There's, oh, yeah. there's, buttons, there's, there? there's a lot of stuff around it. Personally, I don't think this will happen. No, I think it's just sort of posturing, really, isn't it? I think but it's more sort of... It, it, is, it is a lot more realistic than it was, say, 10 years ago. And I think it was about 10 years ago, Arsene Wenger turned around and said, this could happen. So I think it is a more realistic possibility. But it, it could always happen, though. That's the thing. There's, there'd always be someone with big enough pockets to try and make it happen, whether it can get off the ground because the, the loopholes that would have to be made and the leap of faith for clubs to leave their respective leagues... That's a different story, but it always rears its head every sort of two, three years because the way the UEFA competitions are run, they can only be changed every three seasons. So we're sort of locked into the format until 2018, and then it can be open for debate and change. So it's always that sort of elephant in the room of European Super Leagues, and it's sort of you know it's always a hot topic at some point. But again, I think it's just sort of posturing from Premier League clubs and just sort of testing the water. But we'll have to wait and see, won't we? All right, we'll move on from that topic. Uh, we'll talk about something that isn't necessarily uh, you know, on the pitch related, but FIFA have recently had their elections, of course. And finally, there is no longer any set blatter in any way linked with FIFA, so good times on that. Gianni Infantino is the new FIFA president. Now, I have my own thoughts on this, and I have been uh, the sort of FIFA commentator on this podcast, but I'll open this up to other people first. What do we think about Gianni Infantino? I guess the main thing is he won't be doing the Champions League draw anymore. Uh, <laughs> he, he, I, no, I'll be honest, I don't know. He seems a genuinely nice guy, and I like that he did um, he did the kick about with players, and he seems a genuinely nice guy from the interviews, but I don't know enough, and I don't know how much of a link he had with Platini, Platini and all that. So I don't know, but my gut feeling is he seems like a decent guy. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, like I say, I'm a bit sort of got FIFA fatigue, really. I'm just <laughs> bored by it all. Um, the only thing that sort of rings alarm bells for me is the fact he wants to extend the World Cup to 40 teams. Yeah. I just think at the moment, the World Cup, 32 teams, it's pretty much, you know, the optimum number as good as you're going to get. If you sort of make the, it bigger than what it already is, are you going to dilute the talent the sort of I competition think, further? Um, I, think, I know you can make a case of, you know, your, your 2016 is going to ex- ex- extend itself to 24 teams and is that going to be better? But it's just little things like, how do you turn 40 teams into the next round of 16, for example? That doesn't quite fit. and So that doesn't really work for me. But again, like I say, I don't... If you, you can put anyone out there as candidates in as the new FIFA candidate uh, chairman or whatever, and uh, I don't think it would get me excited, to be honest. So we'll just have to wait and see what, what comes of it. Just want to pick up on the 40-team thing. I think that was a vote winner, to be honest. I think he did that as a proposal deliberately in order to win votes off smaller nations where it's questionable whether they qualify for the World Cup. If it's extended to 40 teams, it means they have a greater chance of qualifying for World Cups, which is such a big thing for those nations, I think. Um, That's a very good point, actually. Well, yeah, that is, that is exactly what it was. And this is, for, for me, I think he was probably the second best candidate of the of the five. I would have said Prince Ali uh, bin Al Hussein, however you actually say it, was the best candidate. But when I say these guys were the better candidates, I'm saying it's like, it's literally like having a solid turd over a wet shit. It, it it is it is it is it smells the same, and ultimately, if you've had a curry, it's going to burn the same. But you know, you're you're going to slightly enjoy not having a wet shit a bit more. And I, I don't think he's a good candidate. I think what uh, I think it was Dan who said it before. You, you don't know how big his link was with Platini, and it was a sizable link. 
he's from the exact same nation as uh, Blatter, and I know that we shouldn't tarnish him with that, but he's come from the exact same background. And whilst FIFA can't really afford to be as directly corrupt as it was, as in the brown envelope corruption, we're already seeing how it's still politically corrupt. It's all about doing little favours. And the 40 teams thing you brought up, that's exactly right. That's all it was. It was vote buying. Because what uh, what uh, Infantino is standing for is the exact same thing that Sepp Blatter was standing for. Now, Sepp Blatter wasn't standing for corruption. What he was standing for was something uh, that was originally pioneered by Joao Havalangi, the uh, previous FIFA president. It's called the FIFA Development Agenda. And this is where essentially you curry to the, the smaller nations. You do them more favours. You give them more funding. You arrange it so they got more chance of getting the World Cups. That's We've seen it expanded since 1998 into the biggest World Cup ever. So that's what it's all about. It's called the FIFA Development Agenda, and Gianni Infantino is running on the exact same ticket as Blatter. So whilst it won't be as outwardly corrupt, it is still as politically corrupt as it was before. And Infantino is just another representation of that political corruption, where it's all about it's all about back scratching. It's all about little favors. There's already accusations he bought the USA's vote by promising them a World Cup in 2026. So it's it's for me, it's one of those things. FIFA fundamentally won't but- change. It will just be a little bit less public corruption. At the vote with the voting system as it is, of course you're gonna. If you want to win an election, that's how you've got to do it. Like, I, I, I guess you can't blame him because. Well, no, no, you know, no. You, okay. you, what, what? How do you? You need. Well, you need to change the voting system, but you're, how you do it is a d- difficult question. You're exactly right. The voting system need to be changed. And before they voted in the presidential election, they had a, a series of reforms they had to vote in, and the reforms they voted in weren't actually hard and concrete. It was more let's try and do some of these things. And one of the things they had to do was reform the voting system because it isn't right that Oceania, which has I think it's either 11 or 14 votes, can outvote South America on football matters. Oceania. Well, and also. Yeah, uh, yeah, South America has 10 and Oceania has either 11 or 14, I can't quite recall. And so the, the continent of Oceania, <laughs> with the massive footballing nations of Tahiti, can outvote Brazil. You, you know, it's it's ridiculous. Tahiti has the same uh, vote as France. Well, that's one member, one vote for you, though, isn't it? Yeah, and as much as you sort of look at it and go, well, that's democratic, I suppose that's fair. It's not, because football isn't about being dem- democratic and representative. It's about... It's about representing the sport as a whole, and the sport is bigger in some places than it is in others. That's the simple reality of it. Can I just sorry, go back a bit? Go for it. It's the opposite to what you were saying about the Super League thing. No, it's not saying that the biggest the biggest nations get the most votes. It's saying where football well, has the most... Huh? Isn't that what you believe, though? You think the bigger nations, such as Brazil or England or Germany or whoever, should get more... Well, I think it should be relative to the amount of active football that these these nations produce, essentially. So you take it as a percentage. What what, what Where is their interest in football? How many players are they producing? How much investment are they doing into their youth, for instance? It's it's about the investment in football. And a nation like, let's say, India. It's, it's a cricket-based nation. It's it, it focuses more on cricket. So should they have the exact same number of votes as, say, France, which is a footballing nation? I personally don't think so. I think there needs to be a... Perhaps less an official voting system, more like a, almost like the UN Security Council, where you actually have a bit of deliberation rather than just we all vote and whoever has curry to the smaller nations the best gets gets it through. Because I mean, even the UN identified you can't do it that way because it doesn't work. You do what the smaller nations want, and all of a sudden you're just it's rampant corruption because those smaller nations have less well structured governments that make it easier for corruption. And I know that's such a political point. But it's just the way it is. It's not a perfect system because right now we don't have a perfect world. If it was, if we did have a perfect world where there was no corruption or anything like that, then this would be the perfect system. One vote, one country. That would be fine. But it isn't like that. But you're not going to get the reform changes because too many small countries have got a vested interest to not vote against the change. So, Which is exactly the reason why FIFA should have just been abolished from the start. It's, it's one of those things. There, there were ways to improve it and there were ways to improve the voting system, all that lot. But they would have never got anywhere because, simply put, they couldn't have. FIFA is endemically corrupt. Mm-hmm. That's the problem. It's what I'm saying about Gianni Infantino. He isn't necessarily the worst candidate, but he's going to have to work. And he's already worked in a structure that is endemically corrupt. He's already proven he's willing to work within that by doing the 40 World Cup, by doing the development agenda and promising things to the smaller nations. It's a corrupt system. And it, needs, it just needed to be scrapped. The second Luis Figo dropped out of that race and we got left with, what, six or seven purely politi- political footballers or not even footballers, purely political you know, football guys, that was when it was over. Because there, no, there was no hope for actually changing FIFA at that point. It was over and done. We should have scrapped it and retried this whole, this whole structure. Figo and, seems to support Infantino, though. He played in that, um, that game, that kickabout. I, I will say, yeah, of course they're still going to like back Infantino because it's a, it's a UEFA thing, and Figo clearly does want a future in footballing politics. 
But it, it was just, it, it was rotten from the start. This was never going to really get any better. I said, I think I wrote an article about it quite a while ago, where I said this is just a false dawn for FIFA. It's exactly the same as what happened after Stanley Roos left and Joao Havalangi came in. It's exactly what happened after Joao Havalangi went out and then Set Blasser came in. It's the same situation over and over again. It's the it's the institution that's that's corrupt. They got rid of the big guys at the top, but they didn't tackle the middle guys and they didn't tackle the actual structures in place that meant it got this way. So yeah, I don't really think this is a very good thing. But then again, it wasn't going to be any better than this. <laughs> so it's it's about as good as it's going to be for what it is. All right. Well, unless anyone else has anything they want to add. Nope. All right. We're going to move on to a game now. Nick, this is you versus Dan. You still alive, Nick? Yeah, yeah. There we go. You're was, still alive. I was. I, I didn't really know what to didn't really know what to say in that. I mean, I was, everyone was sort of uh, putting some extremely good views across. <laughs> I didn't, re- didn't really know. What, I, didn't, I couldn't really add my immature views. To it. <laughs> we appreciate your support, Nick. Right, uh, Nick v Dan. Uh, this is a round robin. So the question is: Name players who have captained England twenty times or more. Twenty times or more. There's twelve players, so it's out of twelve. Okay. How does it work? Does it alternate answers or? Yeah. Okay, Nick, you'll go first. Right. Right. I'll go for um, David Beckham. He is one. Okay, Dan. Bobby Moore. He is one as well. Um, Gerard. Stephen Gerard. He's in there too. Alan Shearer. Alan Shearer. He got thirty-four caps as England captain. Well done. Um. Um, John Terry's one, is he? John Terry, well done. He got the same amount of caps as Shearer, 34. Peter Shilton? Peter Shilton is not in there. Oh, it's missed. So, Nick? So, is that 3 2? Yeah, it's 3 2. Um, Lampard? No. Ooh. Brian Robson? Brian Robson, yeah, he's third on our list. He got 65 caps. 3 3. I'm trying to think if Rooney's up to 20 already. I don't think he probably is. Um, Rio Ferdinand, I'm thinking. Or... You've got two more guesses each, by the way. Rio or... or... Um, oh, who was the... Um, probably good captain back in the... Okay, I'm going to have to press you because that noise is making Gary me Neville, Gary Neville. Gary Neville. Gary Neville is not one of them. Ooh. Right, Dan, you can take the lead. Going to go a bit left field. I'm going to go for Billy Wright. He is the most capped England captain with 90. Get in. So, yep, he's in there. Right, Nick, this is your last um, go. Um, Gary Lineker? No. Okay, so in that round, Dan wins 4-3, but this is a round robin, so it uh, scores out enough at the end. The other people you could have had were Eddie Hapgood, who was captain in the 30s, Johnny Hayes, who was captain in the 50s, Bob Crompton, who was captain before World War One, Emmeline Hughes, I think I'm getting that first name right, is a captain between, in the 70s, Kevin Keegan, surprising one you all missed out there, Kevin Keegan, <laughs> captain in the 70s, he's got 31 caps, and I think Brian Robson was the other one you missed. No, oh, I got that one. All oh, right, yeah, Brian oh, Robson. He said him, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, there were there were, there was a few you you could have uh, got. Kevin Keegan was the one I was surprised no one got. Yeah, so yeah, four Keegan, three. I could have uh, apart from that, I wouldn't have got the others. Right. Okay. But we're, we're okay, gonna guys. we'll move on from that. Now, the one thing I want to ask, and this is like, it's actually genuinely irritated me how this has happened because I said at the start of the season I thought they were going to win the league. Why are Arsenal such bottle jobs? <laughs> That's <my> question. <laughs> Dan, you'll probably enjoy this uh, this, this bit. <laughs> Are there any wrong answers? Uh, no, there's no wrong answers, but it's just a general question. Why why can't Arsenal ever ever actually do it? Because they just, I think it was, who was it they lost against? Swansea. Yeah, Swansea. Swansea, they had Swansea not... lost 2-1. Yeah, and they... yeah, I'll admit, it was, like, they did have a lot of bad, I mean, they hit the barbing three times, but I think um, before we start throwing the book, throwing, criticising Arsenal, that game, Alan Curtis deserves um, a lot of um, a lot of credit. Yes, right. I thought he uh, mm-hmm. said they, they could have been falling down after about mm-hmm. ten, fifteen minutes. And um, what he, he say, and he really changed the tactics around. Obviously, it was a tough morning for, or a tough day a whole for Swansea. Their manager going into hospital, so he did well to actually manage the team and to change tactics around. At Emirates is very bold, 
and uh, you got his just rewards. And uh, I think it's uh, very ironic because I think Ashley Williams, I think he gets a lot of, I think he's a really good centre back. I think he should have been um, top of Wenger's list a few seasons ago because they've missed, they've missed some, uh, someone in that, that sort of real leader like Ashley Williams. They've never really had Mertesacker, not really good enough. Koscielny, good, but he's not really a leader. Um, we, well, yeah, we, 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 Swansea obviously did a great job and they had a lot of changes in that game in terms of a, of a first team squad. So it was massive credit for them for getting a result. But this wasn't just Arsenal v Swansea. They played against Barcelona and of course it's Barcelona, so you've got to say they, they were never favourites. But they were the better team for what was it, 60, 70 minutes? 70 minutes, definitely. Bottled it completely. Two goals on the break, absolutely bottled it. Man United playing against what was essentially Man United's youth team. They should have got a result <laughs> there, just didn't turn up. 3 2. Lost that one. So why is it? What is it about Arsenal's team? Is it, is it the manager? Is it the players? What what is it that means they just cannot do the job when the pressure gets ramped up? The it's Arsenal Wenger. You think yes. it's Wenger? Okay, yeah. let's, let's go about Dan. You expand on your view there. Well, how can he be making the same mistakes every season? It's the it's the lack of getting players. It's the lack of well, not the lack of. It's too much loyalty for the same players that are always injured. It's there's too many facets to the the him they all go wrong at this top of the season you think something has to change either in himself or with the club and it's this whole cycle of finishing fourth getting to the second round of the Champions League rinse wash and repeat every season and all Arsenal seems to be worried about is the improvements on the balance sheet and not actually winning trophies I know they've won a couple of FA Cups to you know appease some of the fan base at least over the last couple of years but even as an Arsenal fan how can you be happy with that just that same mentality of just fourth and then out of the knockout rounds. It's just it's just madness, really. I think the fact that this is the most easiest chance that Arsenal Wenger is going to get to win the Premier League again, ever. Because once Pep Guardiola comes in, and you'll get the feeling that Mourinho will probably end up Man United at some point, this is it. This is his last chance, really. And to not win the league this season, if they don't, you'd think, how on earth have they missed this opportunity? So I think it all points to the manager. Not the only reason, but it's certainly... The main reason. Well, I'm going to play devil's advocate to you there. I don't necessarily disagree with you, but he's a manager who's won the league in the past. He's a manager who gets from top four every single season. And arguably, you could say with the transfers thing, especially with the way Arsenal have been going in recent years, I would probably reason, actually, that he isn't in charge of transfers. I'd say he gets given, do you want to sign this player or not? But he probably doesn't have that much input onto who that player is. I, I, I would be very surprised if he has complete control over transfers to say, this is the player I want, can we go and sign him, I want to spend this much money. I'd be very, very surprised. Most I, of the big clubs these days, it's clearly out of their hands. I think Sanchez, Ozil have come in recently for big fees and they've you know they've gone out and spent money on big players when necessary, but I don't think... I, I, their team on paper is as good as anyone's. You know, you look at... You know, Ozil Sanchez, um, you know, they've got Theo Walcott, they've got Giroud, they've got... Walcott Stelton is crap, don't, like... cla- don't not class Walcott in that lot. He does, <laughs> Sorry. Not, he does not deserve to be Sorry. in this Yeah, no, Walcott's in bad reasons. Ozil and Sanchez. Like... Anyway, no, no. Well, anyway, they, on, on, I think on paper their lineup is as good as anyone's. It's just that... It is, it's the winning mentality and it, it sounds ridiculous, but it is. It's um, And I think it's poor management, I think... After the game, I watched the interview with Arsene Wenger and he didn't criticise the players, he just sort of blamed the referee. And it made me think, I've never seen him really come out and say, yeah, we were dreadful today, you know, and have a go at the players, um, which other managers do when need be. Okay. Um, and I can't imagine him doing it behind the scenes either. I just can't imagine him, you know, having a go at the players. Okay. I don't really know how he's doing a job. Let, let's, OK, let's, let's, let's run with my, my argument there. Arsene Wenger is not fully in charge of transfers. I think it's a fairly safe bet to make just because I don't think really any managers in the Premier League fully have charge of their transfers. I don't think Arsene Wenger looked at Mohamed El Nenny and said, he's the solution to my midfield problems. I think he got told we're signing Mohamed El Nenny. Do you really want him? He just well, went, well, we might as well. No, <laughs> might I, as well way around. I reckon Wenger's massively hands on with his transfers. I reckon well, he's okay, just let's, stupidly stubborn. Hi, so, hypothetically, let's just run with it. He's got, a, he's got a team of players who do not get motivated for the big games. It's as, I can't remember who it was. I think it might have been Joey Barton who said it. These players are more worried about taking their selfies and having the nice London life than they are about winning titles. Could you not say then it's more on the players? And it's more on the la- it's, like you said, it's for lack of leaders. It's for lack of people trying to actually get that team motivated rather than being distracted by you know being in a big city like London, having that that, that lovely life you're going to get as a footballer. Could you say uh, it's well, not? It's, it's could you say yeah? Manager has some blame in that he can't do it himself, get that team motivated. But would you not say the root cause? 
the original problem, where, where the symptoms are coming from, would be for players. I would well, say... Chelsea, oh, Chelsea, they don't bother Chelsea. They've won, they've won leagues and they're from London, so I think that's ridiculous. I would say that because Wenger, you could argue maybe because Wenger likes working with young players and such, you could maybe argue that he maybe mm-hmm. deliberately doesn't sign players um, with big personalities to avoid disharmony in the dressing room, you know, taking that risk. They, they were linked with Joey Barton. They nearly signed him a few years ago, I remember, but there was, um, there was an incident with Gervinho, I think. It was in August at the start of the season. They nearly ended up signing him. He would have been a, a leader in the dressing room. I wonder if he'd have... Makes you think in an alternate reality, would he be at Arsenal and <laughs> smashing it? Okay, but I, I, sorry, sorry. I, I, do, just, I do just think <laughs> that I look at Arsenal and I, I look at players like you've got Jack Wilshere, who I, I, I have absolutely laid into previously on this show where I've said he is the epitome of everything wrong with a footballer. But you've got players like that. You've got players like Oxlade-Chamberlain, who is a, is a good player, but he just clearly doesn't take it that seriously. You've got, you've got these players here, and you, you know, Giroud as well, who's more worried about what his hair looks like than genuinely playing a good game. And he hasn't scored for 10 games, yeah, I, no, 11 games. I, I just look at that and I think, especially if a manager isn't 100% on signing these players, how much is it really his problem? Because there's some players, we've all got to accept that just as there's in any walks of life, you cannot motivate. Not properly. You can't get them. Can't get them completely focused. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter if you're Sir Alex Ferguson. You can't stop Ravel Morrison being a dick. You, you, some some managers just cannot do it with these players. So I think maybe could it not be the players? I'm just playing no. devil's advocate here. I reckon it's like I said. He shows too much loyalty to these players. You keep making the same mistakes. So why is Jack Wilshere? I know he's injured a lot, but he surely must be like on his last sort of chance as a, a staple of Arsenal's midfield. Alex Oxley Chamberlain hasn't really done much over the last couple of seasons. Drew. Not a top class striker. So why doesn't Arsene Wenger think, right, here are my I wouldn't say weaknesses, but here's where I've got a strength for my team to make them even better. Why am I why do I keep playing these these players? Why why does he not go out and buy someone in in the uh, summer or winter transfer windows? It's he definitely has a hands on approach to transfers. I mean he's almost part of the board, isn't he? I mean he's he's so hands on. He's probably the most hands on manager we've got in the Premier League. So to say that he's not picking El Nene as as a signing that's a perfect Wenger signing, I think. So, okay, yeah. I think I, 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 I was just playing devil's advocate. Personally, I do agree with that that sentiment. As much as I like Wenger, because I think when he retires, that's the end of the Premier League era. You know, the one that's just gone. That's the real end of the Sir Alex Ferguson era, where you've got the, the big managers who've been in charge for ages. So I'll be sad when he goes. But I think at this point, especially considering the fact that Arsenal do have money to spend, and they have had for several years now, the fact they haven't been making the right moves in the market, the fact they haven't got rid of these players who are just disruptions in the dressing room. Players like Wilshire, as much as he's, you know, an Arsenal lad through and through, he's a dick. He's an absolute <laughs> monstrous dick who who just is not a footballer. He, he might have it in his feet, but he's got fucking four brain cells up there. And he's just incapable of thinking without his penis. He's, he's ridiculous. So I, I've got to say, it probably, I personally would go and say, yeah, it is Wenger. As much as I like Wenger, as much as he has been a success in the Premier League, I'm passing in a gun. I'll, I'll, I'll agree. It's Wenger. Yeah, but I, I just want to make one point. If you look at the recent signings Arsenal made, they've generally been quite good. Like they've signed Petr Cech, who's done a decent job for them. They've got Sanchez, Özil, Monreal, uh, Giroud, who I, I'll disagree. I personally, I think he's a, an excellent striker. Well, uh, there are goals uh, in eleven games. But anyway, no, I think I think if you look at Arsenal's recent signings, I think broadly they've done well. It's who they've not signed is the problem, but the players have actually come in and. But right, if, if you say that, and you say they've got a good team, they've got excellent players, arguably one of the best teams in the league, then surely, again, it would be the manager who's the fault. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. All right, yeah, okay. So they have a good side, but as good a side as anyone, as I've said, but it, there's just something not right in the dressing room. Uh, and leaders. I think it's been pretty obvious for a few years. Yeah, exactly. No, leaders. Name one player who's going to go out there. And, even Leicester, they've got leaders. They've got Robert Hoof, Wes Morgan. They're not, obviously, they're not stand-up players, but they're still leaders in addressing them. I also don't have um, any leaders. People who are actually just, yeah. Murta Saka? I was going to say, wasn't he the Germany captain for a while? Yeah, he did. He's... Yeah, but he just relied on all the good Germany players. But no, no, he's not. He doesn't seem to lead. They don't, there's no one on the pitch who, like, who will, you know, who puts the other players into shape. Like, they haven't, They've lacked that since the year. Oh, of course, yeah. The one player I would say who actually genuinely does seem to shout at other players, despite the fact I've just slagged him off, is Jack Wilshire. But then again, Jack Wilshire's version of, you know, actually trying to motivate players on the pitch and get into them is just mouthing off like a tiny little child and being an absolute 
Oh, I hate Jack Wilshire. But then, but then it's, I guess it's, I guess sorry, it's not just necessarily shouting at other players. A good example, I think, Michael Carrick at Man United. He's a good yeah, all organizing, motivating. Leader, get, but then he doesn't people. he doesn't shout anyway. He, he's very chilled out. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, it's you know it's the organizing, the vote, motivating, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. pat on the back, and all that sort of stuff. The stuff you know, good yeah, managers just, do. Yeah, exactly. All right, okay, we'll we'll move on from Arsenal unless anyone else has anything they want to add. Oh, I just want to say it's yeah. a big game this weekend for him against Spurs. Oh yeah, that is actually massive game. game. Well, I think it's yeah. a. Um, I, I think for Tottenham it's a must not lose game, uh, but I think for Arsenal it's a must win game. Yeah. But they're going yes. to do it without yeah. they're going to do it without Czech and um, Koscielny, so that's going to be quite fun to watch. And that, that Gabriel Paulista, that central defender, well, I think, I mean, I think Ospina, Ospina is not a bad backup keeper of all due he respect. He's, obviously not as, <laughs> he's not as good as Czech, by any, by, but he, he can do a job. He's not as good as McGregor at Hull. <laughs> <laughs> let's be realistic right, okay we'll move on Gabriel from Arsenal. Might, though. Gabriel's a good player we'll move on from Arsenal let's talk about Man United we all like talking about Man United sometimes yeah we do Louis van Gaal now I'm not going to turn around and say oh, is he going to get sacked is he not because we that's been done every single week in every single paper what I want to ask is when he leaves whether or not it's the end of this season or the end of next season or anywhere in between will he have a mixed legacy as being not a great Man United manager but having brought through a lot of good youth players, will he have that legacy, or do we think almost a bit like FIFA? It's a bit of a false dawn. <laughs> uh, I'll just say it's one of these. Uh, it's like him and Moyes just couldn't do it. Well, they just couldn't be the. They weren't. They're not the right replacement for Fergie. Give somebody go down as another sort of. I think failure could be a bit harsh, but it'll be nice for him. I think he's obviously going to go at the end of the season, but it'll be nice for him if he can win the FA Cup or um, or the Europa League, or even get into fourth. One or do one of the thing. And all three of them are not, and they're not impossible. Yeah, I think as Nick says, if they can get a trophy, I think that'll be the perfect time for Van Hal to sort of exit as a, a leaving gift. In terms of the youngsters, though, I think if say Jose Mourinho comes in afterwards, those youngsters aren't really going to play with his track record of playing young players, are they? Because he'll just buy whoever he needs with a well, well, this... United's war chest. So I mean, it's yeah, you, you're right. It's probably a full storm because it looks promising up to now, but it needs sort of Van Hal to to stay there for maybe a year or even a year after that perhaps to really get the the best of these youngsters because they, they look good now, like Rashford, for example, with his four goals. But I uh, think uh, come uh, this, they, might not, they might not get anywhere near the squad because it's well, by well, like from Mourinho. This, this, is, this is my point. And as much as we can say Mourinho doesn't have a good history of bringing through youngsters, one of the things I do have to wonder about is if Louis van Gaal didn't have these injuries at United, would any of these players have even got a sniff in the first place? No. And, and the thing is, when you can say, well, it doesn't matter if they got through in the end, you can say that. I, I would agree with that. But the the idea is when these players come back to fitness, will they get in looking afterwards? I think maybe of all of them, Rashford is the only one. But then yeah, again, we, we, we could have said the same thing about James Wilson last year. And as much as he's going off and doing good things at Brighton, he just... When he comes back, what's he going to do? Is he going to out, 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 outplay Wayne Rooney and Anthony Martial? They had a great 19-year-old potential superstar and they went off and spent 50 million on another 19-year-old potential superstar and shifted the other one out on loan. I have to yeah, wonder I, whether or not that Louis van Gaal has brought in the, the structure to have no, these young I, players having a route through or whether or not it's just of the moment they need to be played. Yeah. I he think... didn't have a choice, did he? He had to play him because there was so many injuries. So, we well, couldn't play know, the tea lady the, and the kit man. And some of them have, have taken the opportunity, but... It's more down to the just sheer fact the physio room is full to bursting at the moment. He hasn't got. A, he has to play him by by sheer sort of um, lack of numbers, if anything else. I think you're missing the point. I think the point is that he's deliberately had a small squad. He's got rid of players, average players like Raphael. Um, there's there's a lot of. He's got rid of. Other, deliberate... He's got rid of a lot of dead wood out. Of deliberately Sorry. got rid of average players who won in the Premier League under Ferguson. No, he's got. You've got your you've got your best team. You've got your you know he's he's got what eighteen twenty first teamers, but he's got rid of a lot of average players who are they they did win the league under Ferguson, yeah, but that they're, they're, they're not they're not top class players and beyond the backup, he's he's deliberately thought if I would rather have these youth players give these a chance than have players you know a big squad and create disharmony. He's always liked smaller squads, as he's said in interviews, and I think. I think it's great he's given youth a chance, and I think I think um, after previous comments you've made about um, English players don't get a chance and all this, and he's given them a chance. He he trusts the young players, and see, yeah. as much as I get your argument that he left a route open deliberately for the, for the young players, I understand that argument. 
I don't think he ever had any intention of really playing these players. And that, for me, is the point. Because it all started at the start of this season when they signed Anthony Martial. Yes, no question, he's a great player and he could be maybe one of the world's best one day. Yeah. But you've got James Wilson. No, I why, think, I think... why sign Anthony Martial if you're intending to give your own players no, because the I don't think... And why then loan, loan him out? I, I think you're getting too hung up on James Wilson. It's I not think just James did... Wilson. I don't think there's ever been any intention. I think it's just I, I circumstance do. completely. I think I think um, James Wilson had a couple of good games. Um, what under gigs just before Van Gaal came, he did. He, he got a decent. He did get a decent crack of the whip last season. I think he played about eighteen games for United in all competitions. He, he got a decent. He got a decent chance, and he didn't. He, he he looked all right, but he didn't look ready. Marshall is a lot better than James Wilson, and um, James Wilson. Yeah, I think, Wilson. I think, I think you're just getting hung up on him. To be honest, I think he's he, he could be, but um, well, no, it's not. It's not, ju- it's not just James Wilson. If we're going to say he's giving he's young not players a chance, as much, so. if we're going to say he's giving young players a chance, then he's giving young players a chance. It doesn't matter if you go, well, he might not be the finished article. Of course, he's not. He's 19. But then no. you spend, then you sign a player who will completely force the other one out, as he has done. Well, forced him out. What well, I will say is, I think it's um, not really. I think it's he's only playing these youngsters because he's he's forced to, not because. Um, not because he actually wants to. But he was forced to because he put himself in the situation where he is now forced oh, to. Oh, he put himself cause... in the situation where he anticipated like 15 injuries. No, I'm sorry, no, no but, chance. But, no, 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 not 15, but I'm sure he looked at some of them. You know, like Cameron Borthwick Jackson, who's been a great success story. Um, I think that's you know, another. Great... This is another perfect example in the same likes of James Wilson. If you were aware of the youth talent you had, if you were aware and you intended on bringing them through, why sign Luke Shaw? If you've got Cameron Borfoot Jackson, who looks like a great talent left back, why sign Luke Shaw? Sign Luke Shaw? The club. But then surely it's then the club has no intention to bring for you. Van Gaal had a say in it. But yeah, of course he did. He, he's again, maybe it's the only situation that I maybe think Arsene Wenger might be in, where it's just you get the approval. <laughs> but if you're aware of the young players and you tend on bringing them through, why do you go out and sign other young players to replace these ones? I, I, <laughs> I think you're being a little bit too romantic, and I, as much as I admire the romanticism and wish it was true that he was genuinely giving these young players a chance. I think if he doesn't get these injuries, these players never play and they fuck off back to Fulham when they're 23. Jesse Lingard, Marcus Rashford, I don't think they ever get a shot if they don't get these injuries. And that is the sign of a club that isn't putting the emphasis on youth development. Rather, it's a sign of a club that's been forced to adjust to the circumstances. In yes. the summer, will, will they spend 100 plus million on All new right. players? Yes, they will. No. Yes, no, they I will. And these players will get even further down the pegging. All right, in the first summer, Van Gaal came, we signed a lot of players. That was when he first came. In the pre- this previous summer, just gone, summer 2015, who did we sign? We signed Martial, who's a kid who's done very well. We signed a couple of centre mids because our central midfield had been dire for years. We need- needed Schweinsteiger mm-hmm. and Schneiderlin. And we got Darmian, who was a big upgrade at right back. You know, we didn't actually do that much. At- well, and we got Memphis Depay, who's also like Martial. He could be a big thing and a lot of other clubs are going in for him. We didn't actually sign a lot of like squad players, players for the sake of it. No, no, I'm, I'm not saying it's, it's like, you know, the Chelsea situation where it's just filling out the roster with other players. But no, my, yeah, my point no. is, why would you sign Memphis Depay if you've got Jesse Lingard? Why sign Luke Shaw if you've got Cameron well, Borfield Jackson? Well, why, but... sign, why sign Martial if you've got James Wilson? If the intention is to bring through the young players, you don't sign these players. Because Memphis and Martial have more are more likely to be special players than Lingard and James Wilson. And whilst I don't <laughs> disagree with you, whilst I don't disagree with you on that point, if the intention is to bring through the youth players, it doesn't matter if you think they're going to be better, you bring through the youth players. No, you no, say no. these te- these people are getting the first team chance. You have to have both. But Man United are clearly doing far more of one than the other, to the point where yeah, if there weren't the injuries... If there weren't the injuries, these players wouldn't be getting the games. And this is the point. The squad is filled up with the other players. It's only because there's injuries these players have got a shot in. No, because it would after... There's... there's United's... I, I, I don't have it to hand, but I reckon United's first team squad, discounting <laughs> any youth players, was probably about 18-20 this season. Are you, are you seriously telling me Van Gaal went into the season thinking that's the eighteen twenty and that's it? That's that all the players that are going to play. I don't expect to get any injuries, anything. No, of course he didn't do that, but I don't think he ever had any intention of giving these players a genuine, you know... Mm. I don't think he ever looked at them and just went, right, I'm going to give this, this guy from the start of the season five games on the first team, let's give him a shot, let's see how he's going to do. I just think, why sign some of the players you've gone and signed if you if this was the intention? And as much as I wish it was the intention of Man United, I truly do. I truly do hope that James uh, Wilson, I hope that Jesse Lingard, I hope that Cameron Borfoot-Jansen turn out to be great players. I truly do hope that. 
it's never the intention. I think I look at the likes oh. of Borthwick Jackson, I look at the likes of Lingard and think, you'll be playing at Everton in four years. In, <laughs> Without in, being harsh. In previous clubs, uh, Van Gaal gave Thomas Muller his debut at uh, Bayern Munich. He got criticised for that because he picked Muller over Miroslav Klose and Mario Gomez, who were the two top German strikers. He, uh, Iniesta, he gave his debut at Barcelona. He has always favoured youth and he's produced some excellent players over the years. And... And he didn't yeah. favour youth at Man United until he got a bunch of injuries. No, no, at the start, he signed a lot of play. No, when he first joined United in his first season, we signed a lot of players and it was a mistake. It's easy to say that now. I was excited at the time. You know, Falcao, Di Maria, etc. I was excited at the time. But since then, you know, this summer, last summer, we signed some young players. We have clearly, we've done really well in the transfer market. And I think, yeah, I, 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 think, I think he's done really well. Uh, we're probably not going to hit any nice middle ground here. I think we're <laughs> we're probably a bit too far think, apart. I don't think we're going to, yeah. Does anyone else have anything they want to say on this one? No, I think uh, it's probably... No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we'll, we'll move on, Ben. That was actually quite a good one there. We'll move on. And it's <laughs> Nick versus Anthony. So it's, Is it how many United players got their debuts this season? Uh, no, that'd be quite a fun one, though. Um, this is Name Clubs Peter Beardsley has played for, and I won't be accepting Man United because he never played a game for them. So he did. He didn't. He played the under-21s. He never played a first-team game for them. So name play, name clubs Peter Beardsley has played for. Okay. Me or Nick? Uh, it's, uh, uh, Nick, you can go first. Why am I? I don't know who he is. You don't know who Peter Beardsley is? It's not like, is it the young, that youngster that plays like Sunderland? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> just do, just do, do I know of the name. No, I just do Dan. But I, I'm not. I'm not confident. I've never heard of Peter Beardsley. <laughs> just do Dan. Just do Dan versus Anthony. Okay, tell you what. Because of that, yeah, we're gonna do. Uh, we both lose. No, wait. Oh. Haven't. Haven't. Uh, okay, yeah, we do. What a stupid <laughs> question. We do Dan versus Anthony. <laughs> I'm, I'm not feeling confident either, to be honest. This is an open problem, isn't it? Like, okay, Anthony v Dan. Anthony, you can go first. <laughs> thanks. Um. I know one, uh, he played for Liverpool, didn't he? He did. There we go, that's one. That's the only one I know. Wow. I think. Actually. Everton. Everton, yep, he played for Everton. He played for both. Uh, uh, Stoke. No, he didn't play for Stoke. I'm going to say this now. Chris came up with these questions. <laughs> um, Newcastle. Newcastle, he played for Newcastle tight twice. Well done. Twice? Yeah. Wow. Um, um, I don't know. Uh, let's think. He was in the 90s, weren't he? Yeah, he played from the 80s to 1999. Let's think. Big teams in the 90s. Um, Blackburn? No. Um, Vancouver Whitecaps? Vancouver Whitecaps. He played for them twice as well. Yes, he did. So you got... Uh, one more each, I think. Uh, uh, it's not double points, is it, for playing for a team twice? No, it's not. Thank God. Um, uh, try the other one, Bolton. Bolton, well done. He played for Bolton after a second stint at Newcastle. Oh, did he? Yeah. Right, Dan, your last one. Uh, crew. That's a very weird guess. No, he didn't play for Crew. <laughs> yeah, okay, so it's free all there. He started his career at Carlisle United, played for Vancouver United, Vancouver, Newcastle, Liverpool, Everton, Newcastle, Bolton, City, Fulham, Hartlepool, and then Melbourne Knights. So that was that was free free. <laughs> City? Yeah, City played for City as well. No, it's three one. I was gonna say I don't think I got three, did I? Got two. No, you got three <laughs> yeah, you got two, sorry, I got one wrong. I was going to say, I've snatched a draw out of that. Well, no, no offside. No. <laughs> so, all right. Okay, before, right, we've got a few more things we want to cover before we get to the final <laughs> game. Uh, England in Europe. So, the Europa League and the Champions League. In the last few years, England have done pretty terribly. Our teams have just not done any kind of good work in Europe. This year, is it any different? Are we doing any better? Yeah, um, I think so. Um, I mean, everyone worries about England versus Italy's coefficient and... Spurs have done our bit, their bit by beating Fiorentina last week. So a very good result, I will say, man. That was a very good result. I was surprised by how well they did against because Fiorentina are a solid side. So, yeah. And also, don't forget, I mean, Man City will probably get to the quarterfinals, so that um, helps as well. So I mean, it's not 
Yeah, Liverpool have gone through as well in the Europa League. United have gone through in the Europa League. Maybe a little bit by the skin of their teeth (laughs) in that second leg. But they went through. You've got City (laughs) against um, Midget Land. Uh, You've got uh, uh, City beat Dynamo Kiev 3-1 away (laughs) from home. That's a great result. Uh, Chelsea still look like they can qualify. They only lost 2-1 away from home against PSG. And Arsenal are probably out. But we've, we've often talked about, you know, this sort of decline of the English sides against the best you know, sides otherwise in Europe. Is that, are we maybe seeing it starting to turn back around? Well, it's sort think... of cyclical, isn't it? I mean, every sort of country gets their sort of spell of winning a, a, a batch of Champions League titles. So if you think of England, they had it from 2005 to 2012. There was only one year. There wasn't an English team in the final. So we've now had a sort of fallow period where you've had the big three of uh, Barcelona, Real Madrid and Bayern, uh, their spell at the top. So... Whether it's going to come around again so soon for English teams, I don't know just yet. But we certainly know no worse. I, th- I don't think you can really say English teams are better until we move a little bit further towards the end of the season because we're still in that just that first knockout round at the moment, aren't we? So if we get a whole batch of teams move into like the quarterfinals of each competition, then then you could say there's been a marked improvement. But at the moment, the signs are encouraging, but I don't think there's too much to sort of uh, compare against last year, for example. So it's still a work in progress, I think. Well, are the two English... things I'd say. First, okay, um, I, uh, I think Chelsea got a similar result against PSG last season. It was sort of a similar sort of the tie was in the balance. PSG possibly slight favourites going into the second leg. PSG ended up qualifying. Um, I think I think PSG are a great team, and I, I think PSG will qualify. And I think um, I think Arsenal will also obviously go out to get Barcelona. I think City may do well. City look favourites to go. You know, may do well. I think that's one thing. City have got an easy-ish draw, so uh, probably going to qualify. The second thing is I think the English teams are taking the Europa League more seriously than ever before. That would have been, so my, that would have been my next question. Are we taking the Europa League more seriously? Because Man United, yes, they had injuries, but it seemed, especially in that first leg, didn't take it too seriously. Liverpool have seemed, uh, you know, sort of, they maybe are trying. It's quite hard to tell. They didn't have too much enthusiasm against Augsburg. And then, obviously, Tottenham have done very well against Fiorentina. So can we say that they are taking it more seriously? Well, yeah. I mean, no disrespect to any Man United or Liverpool fans, but I, you might not get the, the top four finish that you plan to at the start of the season. So this Europa League now takes on extra importance because, obviously, if, if you win that, you get the, the backdoor route to the Champions League. So I think they're taking it very seriously. If not, dare I say, their main focus for sort of maybe Liverpool, you'd, sort of, you'd almost consider their sort of league campaign a bit of a dead rubber. So if they could put not all their eggs in the Europa League basket, but certainly um, the majority of them, I think, yeah, it is taken a lot more seriously. I think the Europa League's a bit more prestigious than it was. I think winning the Europa League today is better than, say, winning it five years ago or something. Well, it's good that you can get in the Champions League as well. Well, yeah, I do think it's actually quite a good competition. I mean, you look at a few years ago when Chelsea won it. They loved it. I mean, I know quite a few Chelsea fans. My dad's a Chelsea fan. They, they all said that it was brilliant. They loved it. They didn't care it wasn't the Champions League. It's winning a major European trophy. So I, I do think uh, sides are starting to take it a bit more seriously. I think the fact that it has got Champions League qualification now, I think that's a, I don't know why that didn't happen sooner. That's a brilliant idea. And yeah, I do think sides are taking it seriously. And I wouldn't bet against Tottenham winning it. I really wouldn't. I don't like Tottenham. I've said this a few times on the podcast. I don't like them at all. But I think they have a very, very good chance of winning it this year. Because they, seem, they seem properly up for it. I, I wouldn't put it past, past the teams to have an all-English final. I, I wouldn't say that was ridiculous. But okay. I think the Dortmund will be a great game, though. Oh, I'm really looking forward to seeing that. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to the second leg, so hopefully it's not a dead rubber by then. But um, I still, yeah, we've got every chance of winning the competition. I mean, you, at, when we saw the draw on Friday, you thought, oh, Dortmund. But then again, if you if you want to win the competition, you've got to meet the best mm-hmm. team at some point. So why not, you know, at this stage than, than anywhere, really? And I think also the Europa League in general... It's sort of much maligned, especially in the group stages, because it just seems a bit of an afterthought, doesn't it, on a Thursday, where you, you know, after all the Champions League action. But I think now it gets to this stage of the t- tournament, it's almost on a parallel with the Champions League itself. You get some really sort of key, interesting mm-hmm. clashes. So, like you say, it's certainly um, getting a better. But I think Spurs, Dortmund, and United, Liverpool, you've got two games there, which are as good as any, as big as any Champions League game, to be fair. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah massive yeah. games. I mean, if I was a Spurs fan, I'd be looking at the game with Dortmund game and going, oh, yes. That's a proper big European team. That's a great game to go and watch. I think it's great, yeah. The yeah. thing the thing that disappoints me, though, with United-Liverpool, I don't like playing another English team in, in Europe. I, I get think. that as well. Yeah, I, I definitely think that. It's sort of like when you're in a European competition, you want to play the weird European sides. You want to get Milan and Sevilla and all that sort of lot. You don't 
it's sort of a bit like oh it's just like another FA Cup game <laughs> playing against the English side alright we'll, we'll move on from that one now and this is one where we'd, we'd, we've got a bit of time ahead of the competition but I want to ask a question and I think I might get a bit of disagreeing with me is this the worst England team ever ahead of the Euros no not ever I mean if you can cast your mind back to uh, not qualifying for 1994 World Cup or even the team in Euro 92 if you can if you're that old but I wouldn't say it's the worst team but it doesn't Okay, well, is it, is it uh, essentially as bad a team as we, we, we've we had in a very long time? There's also the one which didn't qualify for Euro 2008, was it? Yeah, that's yeah, right. On paper, that was actually one of the strongest teams we've actually ever had. Yeah, I'm talking about the, the players, maybe the manager, you want to throw him in there too. Because you look at it and you sort of think, Jamie Vardy, as much as I love Jamie Vardy being you know a great success story, you, you look at sort of the players who've got in that England team, you sort of go, there's no one really that, good <laughs> like you probably maybe say Harry Kane is our best player and as much as I'm sure Dan would say Harry Kane's a brilliant player you compare him to even like the likes of Adjuritz in Spain like who's not even been competing for a Spanish spot you sort of think oh we're just not very good are we uh, that's my uh, argument I don't well, think it'll be uh, it's yeah I think you well, want to well, disagree well, but you can't. Well, I want to disagree but I can't I just don't want to see what I don't want to see is players like Henderson, Wilshere, sort of, who don't really deserve to start, in my opinion. I just want to see players like Barkley, Deli Ali, Vardy, Kane get given the chance to actually start because I think it should be based on how well they played this season rather than going for the old cloggers like Henderson, Lallana dis- and Milner. I'll disagree. I'll say England are a good team. I think after France and Germany, after France and Germany, we've got the two strongest teams in Europe and Spain. Uh, we can we can do something at this Euros. I I believe that. I believe in England. Did you just say we're the fourth best team in Europe? Yeah. So you think we're better than Belgium, Portugal, yeah. Italy? Portugal, yeah. Portugal have no team spirit at all. You, Italy. Think, you think we're better than Belgium, who are currently oh, rated as the best side in the world? Yeah. <laughs> Belgium struggle. Well, Belgium and Wales both fought. Okay, which midfielder do we have who's uh, better than Kevin spot, De Bruyne? I think they ended up left. Which midfielder Sorry? do we have that's better than Kevin De Bruyne? No, no, no. Belgium have a good team on paper, a bit like um, a bit like what I was saying before about Arsenal, really. They've got a good team on paper. De Bruyne has a... And they've uh, been consistently performing for the last two years. <laughs> well, and, yeah, yeah, but so have we. Since the, um, since the last World Cup, we've consistently performed. We've yeah, got... the difference is Belgium actually look good when we, they perform. We struggle well, to beat the likes good. of Slovenia. Or yeah, Slovakia, we, whichever we, we fucking did, one. We did beat them all. Like, what more can you do than get a perfect record in qualifying? Ha- have a look like we might actually be... Tell you what, I, I look at the Euros group we've got. We've got Wales who will just so want to kick the shit out of us. And I wouldn't put it past them because they will be so up for that game and I do wonder about English mentality. So will we. I don't... I think it will mean so much more to the Welsh players than it will to the English players. Are you telling me the likes of James Milner is going to go, oh, I can't wait to get into those Welsh lads... <laughs> Whereas you look at the likes of Ashley Williams and Gareth Bale and all that, you think they're going to be properly. Yeah, but you're comparing two. You're comparing two extremes. You're comparing the most boring English player there is. Who, who, uh, you comparing know. James Milner with Ashley Williams? That's not. That's not like a massive extreme. <laughs> it's, I, I know. I look at Russia and I think they're going to be really wanting to put in a good shift ahead of having their tournament. In the Russia's, World Cup. Russia's impossible to predict. Russia may do really well, have a good tournament. Because they, 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 they've got their it, World Cup coming up, so they're going to want to have a really good tournament. They'll want to, but they can be dire at you know, tournaments. Oh, yeah. it's, it's, and, hard to, it's hard to predict. And Russia. you've got Slovenia, and I think I can't remember if it was Slovenia or Slovakia, but we had the 3-2 game against and we got very close to losing. Was it? I can't, I can't remember. Yeah, Slovenia. And Wilshire scored some wonder goals. Yeah, 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 that game. And I, I just look at that and think, especially with the team we have, with the fact there just seems to be no positivity about the England team. We, and I mean both in the England camp and outside of the England camp. I look at it and just go, are, are we in line for just having another shit tournament? I think it's such a real possibility. I really, I, I you know, I've done it so much on pretty much every show. I love England. I really want to do well. I want all the English players to do well. I don't care who they play for. I want Jack Watmore at Portsmouth to be a good player. And I fucking hate Portsmouth. What about Duncan Watmore? Yeah, he, he could be great as well. Good luck to him at Sunderland. But I just, I look at our team and I look at the other teams in Europe at the moment and I look at our group and I think, we're so not going to turn up. I We're not going to turn up to the Wales game. I know that now. Wales are going to be so up for that game, and they've got such a better team than I think we realise. And I think they're just going to beat us. And I think I our th- spirits will be in the fucking ground for when we play. I Russia. think you underrate our own players. I think. <laughs> uh, 
hope I, I don't. Think, but <laughs> well, I think I think in players like Barkley and Deli Alley, we've got exciting players. Um, we've got Kane, obviously. We've got I think I think you know I think we're we're capable of uh, competing with anyone in Europe. Let's have the Leicester City spirit. Yeah, let's take drink water and Vardy and put them in the first team. We'll take the Leicester oh, spirit. Well, I think they definitely should both go. Drink water and Vardy definitely should go. Um, um, all Brighton. He oh, could be yeah, in the he's squad. Been he's been class. That assist last on Saturday to his yard was brilliant. Yeah, like I said, I I'm hoping that you're right, Anthony. I'm sincerely are, but I. Just, I don't have a good feeling ahead of the tournament. Yeah, <laughs> I think we're okay. going to be crap. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're going to. I'm always optimistic when we actually get into the tournaments, and I love seeing international tournaments. But for once, I just genuinely think we're going to be crap. <laughs> but, I'm looking for. I hope we do a few podcasts over the Euros. Yeah, we'll, we'll try and we'll try and make sure we do some special podcasts for everyone for the Euros. Okay, let's move on to the the final game, our final bit of the thing, and this is finally. Uh, I think it's uh, who is it? It's got? me and Nick. It's you and yep. Nick. So let's see if you prefer this one, Nick. <laughs> okay, I want you to name football league clubs. Oh, brilliant! Whose name begins with A, B, or C, but they have to have played in the Premier League. Oh, brilliant! So, so for example, AFC Wimbledon or Accrington Stanley have never played in the Premier League, so they wouldn't be it. Okay, right. So, right. Do so we, let's go first. We'll start with you, Nick. Right, okay, Birmingham. Birmingham, yep, that is one. Burnley. Burnley, yep, that's also one. Bolton. Yeah, there we go. Blackburn. Oh, okay, we're just we're just flying through this, aren't we? Uh, Charleston. <laughs> give us a sec, give us a sec. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> um now now that now uh Oh wow. Um A Can I preemptively say Aston Villa? No. <laughs> you wouldn't be wrong, but no. Um, oh, God. Uh, this is all going so well. Um, Got five more teams. Oh, there's only five more. Um, oh, God. Oh. Is it only the Premier League era? Sorry. Yeah, only the Premier League era. Right, okay. Um, uh, in your own time. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Stop making sexual noises. <laughs> Coventry? Coventry, good shout. There we go, that's free free. Cardiff. Uh, straight oh. straight off of that there, that's 4-3 uh, to Nick. Um, uh, Oh, God. Would you both like a clue ahead of the final three? No. Okay. <laughs> dun dun. Dun dun. Dun dun. Did it, did it, did it, did it. Nice. Oh, well, yeah, that didn't work. Right, I'm going to have to press you for an answer there, Anthony. Yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, <laughs> this is horrible. Uh, uh, can't be right. I already said it. Brighton. No. No, I don't know. Nick? <laughs> um, holy fuck. Um, um, oh, I've got one. I think. Come on, Nick. Hey, uh, I think we've laid. I mean, I've done all the championship, and it's just now. I just need to think of. Um, I need to think of the uh, League One and League Two clubs. Um, is there only three more? There's only three more. Would you like? The, there's. You've got one answer left each. So no, would you like the clue? I don't, I don't want a clue. Okay. Oh, I thought of one. Uh, Blackpool. Blackpool. There we go. Not Nick's thanks. congratulations to there, Nick. You got five out of five. Anthony. I guess the last two. Yeah, Anthony. I'll, Anthony I'll, still I'll got. Guess. Anthony still got a go left. So Anthony. I've got, I've still, I've got the last two. I know them. Is it Bristol? It is not Bristol. Wow. Okay. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. You can no, get both. Go for them. I know, 
I know them both. It's Bradford and Barnsley. Uh, Nick, Nick's absolutely smashed it there. I'm not going to give you the extra two points as much as I'd like to, but uh, you got all five there. So that means, oh, wow. Okay, Anthony, you finished bottom of our game with three, I think. At least I was brave enough to do the Beardsley question. Yeah. Dan, you mm. came next with seven, and Nick has won with eight. Okay. Hooray! He, he, should get, he should lose a point for not knowing who Peter Beardsley is. <laughs> yeah, uh, he may have only won because he just opted out of one of the questions. Yeah, exactly, it's not really the spirit of it, is it? <laughs> but well done to Nick. Okay. Well, Hull have beaten Birmingham as well, fantastic. No, sorry, Birmingham beating the Hull, fantastic news. Yeah, okay, uh, thanks for joining us on this week's uh, V2 Football podcast. Uh, please check out our recent interviews. We've had an interview of Alan Tong, who used to play for Manchester United, and Diamit O'Carroll, if I'm pronouncing that right. Diamit O'Carroll. Diamit O'Carroll, yeah, we've got an interview of him. Uh, Chris Lapp did both of those, so please check those out on the uh, V2 website. Uh, please check us out on Twitter and on Facebook and all the good stuff. Thanks for joining us this week, and goodbye. Bye. Can I just get a quick plug in for my website, please? Uh, if you could follow it at realfootballman.com, I would really appreciate that. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks, guys. Hello, this is Bianca Westwood from Gillette Soccer Saturday on Sky Sports, and you are listening to the V2 Football Podcast.